to help me make a little uh, a circle here. Come on up. I'm going to make a circle here because you're going to be part of the story. It's a very creative circle we have. Yes. That's good. That's always true. That's great. Okay. This, my friends, I am glad to see you in this circle. And today, you are the disciples. This is Jesus. Hmm? And Jesus and the disciples had just had this wonderful meal together. Fish right there out outside by the lake. And Jesus. After they'd gotten their bellies all full, wanted to make sure that they were still full of all the good teachings that he had given them. And he said to them, now, I'm not going to be with you all the time, but I want you to remember everything I taught you. You remember to be joyful. Don't you remember that? So they all said, oh, yes, Jesus, we remember. Can you nod your head? Yes. Sure. We remember that. Mm. We're going to be joyful. And as long mm. as you're around, you make us so happy. We are joyful. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus says, do you remember? I said, be peaceful. Oh, yes, Jesus. They were sure. like, oh, yeah, sure. We got that. But thanks, Jesus. And as long mm. as you're here, oh, we feel so much peace. Thank you. Thank you. Then Jesus. Do you remember to love one another? Oh, of course. We remember to love one another. And it's like, oh, we do, we do, we do. We just love each other. And we really love it when you're with us. And it helps us love each other. And so thanks. And then Jesus said, okay, you remember to be one. They looked at each other. They're like, uh, I'm not exactly sure what happened, but I think they all said, yes, we're number one. And they're all like, yay, yes, we're number one. And Jesus, he thought he had failed. He thought, oh, no, these disciples have not gotten it. No, 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 it's not your number one. It's that you are all one because God loves all of you and gives you grace and forgiveness and that's what you've got to be one about. And then, as Jesus was opening up his arms and blessing them, suddenly, hmm. He was gone. <laughs> I couldn't figure out where he went. <laughs> where did he go? They all looked around and said, He was right here.
Jesus taught us, wherever there is love, there is God, and we keep the Spirit of God, and that Spirit of love going wherever we are. Thank you. Let us pray. God, thank you for your love, and thank you that we can see Jesus in all the love that is around us and in us and through us. Keep helping us be that love, like, like Jesus. Amen. My sinus infection went right up to the edge of pneumonia by the time I got to the doctor, but the x-rays were negative, and the antibiotics are doing their work. But I'm still going to start being sniffly, and we'll be sipping water from time to time. Well, that's vodka. Oh, no, <laughs> would stand with me for the reading of the text from the very end of Luke's Gospel, the very last verses. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father has promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power, from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, lifted up his hands, blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple blessing God. The word of God for the people of God. I have one show and tell I'm going to put on the communion table for you to take a quick look at as you come up for communion. This is our very first bookkeeping record book. This is a little notebook that records our first, very first offerings. And the very first offering we took was not for ourselves, but it was a mission grant to rabbis for human rights to replant olive trees on the West Bank, which Israeli Defense Forces had uprooted. So take a look at this. It's part of the substance, the character of our life, but we remember this as part of our life. On the liturgical calendar, today is Ascension Sunday, which com commemorates Jesus' final ascension into heaven after his several post-resurrection experiences with the disciples. This Sunday is also the last Sunday of Easter Tide, the 50 days that began on Easter Sunday and goes through Pentecost, which we celebrate next week. Easter Tide is the season between God's resurrection moment on Easter morning and the breakout of the church on God's Pentecost Sunday when the Easter movement begins. Easter Tide is the believing community's gestation period when we receive what we need for life outside the womb of God. More about this in a minute. Some years ago, Mahan and Mark Siler and I, plus a couple of friends from Raleigh, took winter hikes on the Appalachian Trail every winter. We would meet in hot springs, usually on a Wednesday or Thursday evening, share a wonderful meal at Elmer's B&B, then sort out all of our provisions to equalize the weight of our packs. Then after breakfast the next morning, one of Elmer's folks would drive us a half an hour, 45 minutes away, either north or south, and we would walk our way back to Hot Springs. Speed was never a goal. <laughs> In fact, I remember one morning we stopped mid-morning after a steep hill that we finally topped, take a break for some water, 
sat down and began telling stories, and before you knew it, it was lunchtime. We figured, what the hell, let's just keep, keep, keep having some fun, telling some more stories while we eat lunch. Most of you have hiked one trail or another where the route is marked by blazes painted on tree trunks. You have to keep an eye on those from time to time because there are times when some traveled footpaths veer off in one direction or another. Most of the time, our group stay pretty close together, bunched up, chattering or sometimes walking in silence. But we also honor from time to time some distance, scatter out a little bit further along the trail, knowing that eventually we would bunch back up together. But when you do that, you have to pay attention to those blazes even more carefully. One time, Mahan was out front. The rest of us finally bunched back together, but Mahan was nowhere to be found. Mark remembered seeing a, 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 an offshoot of a trail a ways back, so he dropped his pack and began jogging back down the line. Sure enough, Mahan's eyes had played a trick on him. And he had taken off on one of these offshoot trails, and it took him a little while before he realized his mistake. Some of you know about the practice or the phrase of appreciative inquiry. It's a tool for evaluation, a performance review, or an individual, a project, or an organization. Periodic evaluation is always important, but you know most of the time how those things go. It becomes a recitation of complaints. We're not doing this right. We're not doing that right. Just think of how many times you've either written a letter to the editor or thought about writing a letter to the editor. What is it that spurred your interest in doing that? Usually it's a complaint. Something you didn't like. Far fewer times do we write letters of recognition and thanksgiving and blessing. Appreciative inquiry attempts to turn the table and focus on reinforcing what's working more than what's not working. And that's what I want to use this sermon today to do, some appreciative inquiry feedback. To prepare us for Pentecost, for our breakout Sunday, I want to do some appreciative inquiry work with you to tell some stories about what makes me not just willing but eager to come back to this house of meeting week after week, even on those occasions when I'm not in the best of moods, even when I'm occasionally tired or distracted, even when, as an introvert, introvert I just assume spend time alone. <laughs> Dozen or so years ago, Teresa and Troy's kids were young. They related a story to us pastors about their first visit to Circle of Mercy. As they were leaving the service, walking to their car, their youngest suddenly, without prompting, said, I think these people really like kids. <laughs> In my mind, that small anecdote remains among the highest compliments this congregation has ever received. I believe with all my heart that the single most important thing we do as a people of faith is to nurture the faith of our young ones. We can't predict what that faith is going to look like, but that is the most fundamental reason we are together. The greatest exercise we undertake as a congregation is not the busyness of our members, the vigor of our mission projects, or even the brilliance of our preaching, today being an exception. <laughs> no, our greatest achievement is the vitality of our youth. Whenever someone asks me when I'm out going here, there, or yonder, how things are going at this church, the first thing I tell them about is our youth. It's just amazing. By now, most of you have heard the core story about how Circle of Mercy began. First is a daydream when Nancy and Joyce and I were hiking in the mountains. We finally had to agree to either stop talking about it or do something about it. 
Getting ready for that first gathering took more work than you would think it should. But we finally got there and 20 people showed up. We took that as a sign we could do this a few more times. Within a month, we had more people than would fit in anyone's living room. So we agreed to take up an offering just to cover the cost of renting a room at the Cathedral of All Souls. Eight weeks after our first worship service, our first mission offering, as I mentioned, was to support that Rabbis for Human Rights project. On January 27, 2002, it records nine households contributed $305, which we promptly sent off after we got our first check. In the first weeks of our existence, we called for a common purse to serve the life of this community and also to share with the larger world. It's a pattern we continue. Though filling in the details always requires much conversation, sometimes no little disagreement, and many prayers for discernment. It's work that we do, but it's holy work. One of the most unusual things we did from the beginning was to attempt to model shared leadership with three of us as co-pastors. We were told more than once that this would not work. And in fact, it isn't as easy as our idealistic minds would have us believe. It took some work. We meant this to be a model just for, not, just for how we as co-pastors would collaborate, but how we as a congregation would work together. We believed that the principal duty we had as designated clergy was to call out the prophetic and pastoral abilities and energies of this entire congregation. The most important leadership principle I know is this. The sole purpose of structure is to create the conditions for creative chaos and good ideas to run wild. When trying to come up with a fitting name for this new congregation, the words among the three of us that kept coming up repeated, repeatedly were the words mercy and circling. Mercy was important to us for very tangible reasons because all three of us had been part of highly committed but ultimately failed attempts at a Christian community. I don't know why that passionate faith has a tendency to jump the rails and turn into accusatory faith. We shouldn't be so surprised though because Jesus' disciples did the same thing. He was following in their footsteps. Moreover, Nancy Joyce and I had been part of communities that simply wore its members out. <laughs> Too often our prayers were, were more like complaints. Look, God, look at how tired I've gotten doing all these great things in the world. As if God honors exhaustion above all else. <laughs> Finding and deciding on mission engagements has been and will continue to be an important part of our common life. But the most important pastoral work we do is to identify, bless, and call forth the redemptive healing work already being done in your daily lives. We don't necessarily need to do more things in order to be faithful. We must elevate the virtue of delight. How above God, above all, God takes great delight in us, prompting us to take great delight in each other, and each other, and each other, on and on, until we all the nations are covered. Most often, we need to encourage and sharpen what's already being done by people who don't have theology degrees. One of the ways we typically will physically display the vision of shared leadership is by meeting in a circle, or at least a horseshoe. So we can at least see a few faces of, of the others who are here. 
And at the center of our circle is always this round communion table. It's a visceral, physical, and even tasty reminder every week that grace is available no matter how your week's gone, no matter if you've failed miserably or you've been failed miserably. Sustenance is available and offered without reference to worth. You don't have to have your Sunday best on physically or emotionally to come to this table. The same goes for what I think is our most important activity in worship, which is our joys and concerns time. When anybody, literally anybody, young or old, are authorized to say aloud the grief or the joy that preoccupies your life at the moment, as Tyrone says it, what keeps you up at night? Or what gets you up in the morning? I don't know of another congregation which requires every member to join the church every year. In case you didn't know this, we don't have indefinite membership at Circle of Mercy. Everyone is asked year after year to be very intentional about being here. We give people several options about how you want to be here, what level of involvement we, you want to be here. And of course, we need a core of members willing to do three things together to pledge to affirm our mission and vision, to participate faithfully, and to contribute generously to our common purse. We call these partner members. But we also want to be fully welcoming for those who are not ready to make that kind of commitment. We call these companion members. And there's always space, always space, for all here. If I had another hour or two or four, I would say about, talk about our desire from the beginning to be a singing church, not just to have professional music, but a membership that vigorously practices this joyful discipline, regardless of the quality of your voice. St. Augustine said, those who sing pray twice. I would talk also about our commissioning services, the rituals that we do from time to time to bless special undertakings, mission adventures, or any other significant transitions. We have commissioned in this circle people who are about to commit acts of civil disobedience. We've also commissioned parents who are welcoming a new child, biological or by adoption, into their home, and everything in between to lift up these moments of great grandeur and transition. I would talk about the time, the commitment from the beginning to have as small an administrative footprint as possible, most visibly expressed in our choice to meet in space for our use, rent space for our use, rather than own our own building. Though I would hasten to say that we depend on the generosity, generosity of congregations like Land of the Sky, who do own a building but choose to share their space at minimal cost. I remember the first time we were actually required to get liability insurance. The agent that I met with kept trying to sell me more and more extra bits of coverage that we really, really didn't need. And I was getting a little frustrated. And finally, I spotted, I looked over, and I said, see that round Formica folding table? That's the most expensive thing we own. <laughs> he finally quit pestering me. If I had a lot more time, I would talk about our weekly worship service as the most important thing we do, not because God likes a regular schedule of compliments. God is not egotistical. That would be us. We are realistic in this regard and we recognize that our eyes and ears have to be regularly sharpened and tuned to see and hear what the Spirit is doing in the world. Finally, back to where we started. With that odd statement of Jesus to His disciples, stay here, hang out, keep the door shut until you have been clothed with power from on high. You've got to just 
too late a little bit more. You would think that the resurrection moment was when the action got underway. But no, before we got underway, some action needs to happen inside of us. And it has something to do with getting connected with power from on high. Power which is not supernatural, but is beyond the reach of our typical self-serving ways. Power from on high is a way of describing imagination, the breakthrough of the previously unimaginable. Mark Twain put it this way, you can't depend on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. I'll leave the rest to you. Making choices is hard work. Because every time you say yes to one thing, you're likely you're saying no to something else. And of course, gestation is not a one-time thing. It's more like the growing of new skin cells on each of our bodies, which is happening all the time. What do you think are the abidingly faithful characteristics of this congregation? What are the things that we need to nourish and what things do we need to neglect? What are the healthy habits we should pursue as we move into whatever new future is unfolding? And whatever changes are to come, what are the qualities we want to sustain? How do we keep our eyes on the trails blazes or even blaze new trails? What would getting power from on high look like? Is Pentecostal power still available, just look for a minute around the room. You can see how far it is we still have to go to align our community with the reign of God. But nevertheless, we are extraordinarily blessed. And as we learn to bless, so will we be a blessing. We will speak of these things again. Amen. struck in this passage in Luke about this wild story of Jesus' ascension, about how it was in the midst of his offering blessing that he ascended. And then somehow they received that in such a way that they were able to bless God. Perhaps that is what we practice again and again here. It's blessing God, receiving blessing. And our prayers are all about that. How do we bless God with all that is within us, with our joys and thanksgivings? And how do we receive the blessing of these companions as well as the blessing of a merciful God who is in the midst of our crying out, our tears, our what's keeping us up at night. So friends, I invite you into this moment in our time together. ...that are longing for blessing. Blessed are the agnostics. Blessed are they who doubt. Blessed are those who have nothing to offer. Blessed are the preschoolers who cut in line at communion. <laughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit. You are of heaven, and Jesus blesses you. Blessed are those who no one else notices. The kids who sit alone at middle school lunch tables. The laundry guys at the hospital. The sex workers in the night shift street sweepers. The closeted. The teens who have to figure out ways to hide the new cuts on their arms. Blessed are the meek. 
You are of heaven, and Jesus blesses you. Blessed are they who have loved enough to know what loss feels like. Blessed are the mothers of the miscarried. Blessed are they who can't fall apart because they have to keep it together for everyone else. Blessed are those who still aren't over it yet. Blessed are those who mourn. You are of heaven, and Jesus blesses you. I imagine Jesus standing here blessing us because that is our Jesus nature. This Jesus cried at his friend's tomb, turned the other cheek, and forgave those who hung him on a cross. He was God's beatitude, God's blessing to the weak in a world that admires only the strong. Jesus invites us into a story bigger than ourselves and our imaginations. Yet we all get to tell that story with the scandalous particularity of this moment and this place. We are storytelling creatures because we are fashioned the image of a storytelling God. May we never neglect that gift. And may we never lose our love for telling the story. Amen. Amen. your image of the marks along the trail. Mm -hmm. This table is one of those blazes on the trail for me each week. There was a period of time where I was away from the circle and I would dip back in here and there and I would slip in after the service started and come to this table and then slip out with Abby in my arms. And this was a place that held that and that that was okay and it was blessed. We come to this table every week because I think also as Ken was naming that when we teach our children and our youth, we don't know where that faith will take them, what steps it will lead them down, what roads they will follow, what blazes they're going to pay attention to. But we keep teaching it. We keep inviting them into this story because this table symbolizes what it is that gives us the strength and energy to do the slow and steady work of that teaching. Whether we're a parent or a gardener or a teacher or a nurse or a doctor or a healer in all senses of that word. However we do all of those things, we need to be reminded every week. We need to follow the blazes of the trail to this table, to take this bread and this juice into our bodies physically to remind us that we have what we need and that we come to this table every week as a community to remember that. When Jesus gathered with his friends in the last meal that he was to have with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it. He said, this is my body given for you. Every time you eat this bread, I want you to remember me. In the same way he took the cup and gave thanks. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. Every time you drink from this cup, I want you to remember Remember what we've shared, remember what we've talked about, remember what we've learned and experienced together, remember me. So friends, I invite you to this table that I hope is a blaze on the trail of your week, that is a touchstone that keeps you on the path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.